So uh, here at the end of class, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about case studies. Right? Now, case studies uh, are a specific type of small end design that uh, involve a very detailed analysis of a single individual or a single event. So, uh, let's talk about some examples here. Uh, we'll start off with individuals. Uh, case studies tend to be the most common in uh, clinical psychology. So you'll have an individual with some particular type of disorder that uh, is unlike anything that the researchers have ever really seen before. And uh, so it's useful to really perform a detailed analysis on these individuals and try to learn all we can, but uh, again, you're going to be really limited in your generalizability, like we saw before. So one example of a, a classic clinical uh, historical case is uh, the story of Phineas Gage. Uh, does anybody remember Phineas Gage? <coughs> so what was the deal with him? Exactly. So uh, there was this really bad accident. I can't imagine anyone would, uh, mo I don't imagine most people would be able to even survive this, but Phineas Gage had this iron rod blown clear through his head. It destroyed a significant portion of his frontal lobe of his brain, uh, and I think he, he lost that eye as well. And um, he survived, but went through this major personality transformation. <coughs> Like you said, he went from being this great upstanding citizen to kind of a low life who nobody liked. And uh, so that's an extreme example, uh, but it was really one of the first times that people started to realize that there is a clear relationship between brain structure and something like personality. Uh, so a really useful case, even though it's just a single individual. Uh, now, one exception to the, the, this notion that these are usually clinical cases is, um, uh, just for example, these studies that look at the limits of human memory capacity. So there are, these, some, there are some people out there that uh, seem to have this amazing talent to memorize certain information. Uh, one of the classic examples is this guy, uh, Rajan Madhavan, who I think when he was really young, like around his sixth birthday, he uh, realized that he had this talent for memorizing things really quickly and memorizing vast amounts of information. So I think after his birthday party, uh, he went out in the parking lot and memorized the license plates on all the cars or something like that. And he's most famous for uh, memorizing the digits in pi, you know, pi, the, the non-repeating uh, decimal 3.1415, I don't know much farther than that. Uh, but he memorized it to over 31,000 places. So this is pi, this digits that you see here are pi to, I think, 1,024 places. Uh, so can you imagine knowing 31 screens or so like that just from memory? It's pretty mind boggling. And so uh, that does tell us something about the limits of human memory. Uh, but it also might shed some light on normal memory. Right? So, uh, anytime you look at the extremes of intelligence, for example, uh, that can be really useful for just learning about the nature of intelligence. You can look at people who have uh, extremely low intelligence, some type of developmental uh, deficit <coughs> or disability, and then people who are uh, really advanced. And those are really useful cases to study. They're extremely rare, so you really have to do these case studies. And uh, as I mentioned, you can also look at the impacts of specific events. Um, a great example is if you're interested in the response to, uh, psychological response to disasters. Um, quite a few researchers looked at the psychological impact of the September 11th attacks. And that's just not something that you can really simulate in a lab. 
the dramatic impact of that type of an experience. So, uh, for example, they looked at uh, superordinate goals. So people who usually don't get along uh, when they're faced with one of these catastrophes will put their differences aside and work together toward common goals. And so it kind of promotes group harmony. Um, I'm sure there are some researchers who have already started looking at the impacts of the recent uh, tsunami in Japan. Uh, that's a major catastrophe over there. <coughs> over 10,000 people dead, they're saying now. Uh, so again, that's not something that could really be simulated. Uh, and I've even heard over here, people have been conducting some surveys looking at Americans' opinions of uh, nuclear power after some of the reactors over there have been experiencing some difficulties and melting down in the wake of that tsunami. So it, again, that's something that can affect the way that we evaluate the world and the decisions that we make. Okay. Uh, now, these case studies will sometimes use a variety of different methods. So uh, there might be some direct observation, uh, which we'll be talking about in our final chapter, chapter 12, starting next week. Uh, there might be some more formal psychometric tests, <coughs> actually having people fill out questionnaires, maybe even some physiological testing, measuring levels of, uh, say, galvanic skin response, heart rate, things like that. <clears throat> but uh, let's wrap things up by talking about how we can evaluate case studies. The biggest advantage is, of course, the incredible amount of detail that you can get about a single individual. It's a really big distinction between the large end studies, because with the large end study, you get a group average, but you don't get any detail about individual performance, usually, uh, aside from maybe the, the researcher might anecdotally mention some of the feedback that they got from some of the participants. Uh, but uh, with these, you just get this level of detail that you don't find in the other types of research. You even get more detail than in the small end design very, very personal. Uh, these uh, can be used, case studies can be useful because uh, they can help with the falsification of certain types of hypotheses. And uh, if you remember, falsification is really important to good science. If you have a scientific theory, it needs to be possible for that theory to be proven wrong by evidence. Even if it's just a single case, that a single case can still falsify a theory sometimes. And a great example is the John Joan case that we saw the video on uh, earlier this week. So that was a case study, very rare type of situation, sex reassignment at birth, but uh, it really falsifies the strict blank slate idea that gender is entirely the product of one's upbringing. Right? And it shows that maybe there are other things like biological structure and DNA that play a role in that. Um, one big drawback, of course, of, of these case studies is that uh, the experimenter has little to no control. So uh, when you're looking at these events, like uh, the tsunami and things like that, uh, of course we don't control when those happen. We don't control what information people are exposed to. Uh, so we're dealing with the real world, and the real world is kind of unpredictable. So you have to kind of deal with problems as they emerge. And then uh, you run into some of those external validity issues, particularly because uh, you're working with single subjects. And uh, like we just said before, you can't really say that what's, what's true for one individual is true for everyone. So, Any questions about any of this stuff? All right, well, that's it for today.